All right, what's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 51 of the Retic Lounge. Lucas and I tonight are going to be joined by probably everyone's at least top five favorite re retic breeders. Um, someone who's taken selective breeding to just another level. So um, tonight we are going to be joined by Shane Costello of SC Constrictors. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this one because I think when we think about like kind of where the industry is going in terms of people being specific and making you know, like a, a one or two gene animal look really, really good. Um, I think Shane has just like had that stick to with his project. And so we're going to be talking all about that, uh, all about Shane's uh, vision from the beginning to where it's at, to where it's going to be in the future and what it takes to actually have that stick to to push through and not just like give up on a project midway that a lot of people do but um before we bring him in um just want to remind everyone who is listening if you're a fan of the retic lounge even if you just like a handful of episodes and you think they're valuable um share this with your friends we have that 1000 subscriber giveaway that we are doing once we hit 1k um when we hit 1k you guys are going to be getting uh one of you will be getting at least 300 dollars worth of VivTech products we'll send you over a gift basket uh, on top of that, every additional 100 followers, we will be donating a bronze US ARC membership. Uh, so don't just help us get to 1K to be at 1K, but really, as we continue to grow, we'll be giving more money back to US ARC. And uh, we want one of you guys to have some amazing VivTech product. Whether you're just getting into retics or you've been breeding for years, the first place you want to visit is Stewart Design. More and more breeders keep showing up at shows, on Morph Market, and are all over social media. Sometimes it may feel possible to get anyone's attention. Stewart Designs helps small businesses like yours do big things through brand clarity, helping entrepreneurs to start and scale businesses that are easy to know and love. Their work can help any company or industry, but they've done a ton of work for ours. Stewart Design created the brands for US Arc, Canova, Reach Out Reptiles, Coiled, and dozens of other well-known reptile breeders. Like many of us, the owner of Stewart Design, Blake, is a keeper and breeder who fell in love with Retix through first working with Garrett Hartle. Although Stewart Design does a lot of corporate work, Blake has a passion for working with people in the reptile industry. Stewart Design can help if you're just getting started or you're ready to take things to the next level, you're struggling to stand out and build your presence online or at shows, you don't want to be like the other guys or get lost in the crowd, and you want to make your own way doing what you love. And also, you have big ideas and know your business is special, but you need help sharing it with the reptile community. If something here resonates with you, reach out to Blake and have a conversation. To learn more or get started, visit stuartdesignbrands.com or call them at 855-SD-LOGOS. Clear brands own markets. Stewart Design helps create them. If you are in the market for an enclosure for your reticulated python or any other one of your reptiles, Focus Cubed Habitats is your one-stop shop for not only the best looking cages on the market, but also provide amazing features and add-ons to your cages. We partnered with Focus Cubed Habitats because they continue to innovate and change the way we house our animals unlike any other caging company out there. Their cages are designed intelligently and provide the most stylish and secure housing for your animal's comfort and well-being. Visit focuscubedhabitats.com for your animal's caging needs. Again, visit focuscubedhabitats.com for some amazing and stylish enclosures. We also want to thank VivTech Products for being an affiliate sponsor of the Retic Lounge. Stop by VivTech Products for the best UV spectrum lighting on the market that will enhance and improve your snake's overall well-being and health. Visit VivTechProducts.com and use the code RETICLOUNGE23 today for 15% off. Again, visit VivTechProducts.com and use our affiliate code RETICLOUNGE23 today for 15% off. Looking for the perfect accessories for your hatchlings or juvenile retics? Look no further than Heli Guy Serpents. Our sponsor, Chris Sexton, is coming in hot with an amazing 3D printer, creating top-notch perches and other caging accessories for your beloved pets. Enrich your retics environment with their high-quality products. Use our promo code TRL10 
for a 10% discount on your purchase. Visit them today at heliguyserpents.com and start giving your pets the best. Heli Guy Serpents, the premier source for 3D printed caging accessories. Again, that's www.heliguyserpents.com and use our promo code TRL10 for 10% off all of your 3D printed accessories today. Yeah. Anything uh, else you want to mention before we jump into this, Lucas? No. Let's go ahead and grab Shane, get him on here, and I think we got him on. Shane, what's going on? How are you guys? Thanks for having me on tonight. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks for coming on on uh, such short notice. We appreciate it. Yep. Happy we can make this happen. Tight schedules for everybody. Hey, yeah, I know it. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people always ask me, they're like, man, you have interviews pretty late. And uh, I'm like, yeah, but we haven't actually had one person who like couldn't do it. So it almost seems like for all of us that are busy, the later yeah. times is actually preferred. Yeah, this is kind of like the only free time really is is kind of late at night. Everyone's asleep. Kids are in bed. Wife's asleep. Everything's kind of all the busy cleanings all done for the day. And it's this is the time to kind of chill, really. Yeah. Uh, so we are recording this right now on... Uh, what is it? World Snake Day? World Snake um, Day. Yeah. Do you guys know like when that started? Do you have any historical, did any of you guys like Google that? I, I didn't even no. know it was World Snake Day. No. Yeah. That, I, Nathan, I, Nathan's on yeah. a different level of busy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's all over Facebook. Crazy busy on Facebook. Yeah. yeah. Hope you guys don't kill me with this camera. I'm going to do my best. No, you're okay. We love looking at your mouth. Um, all right. We'll, we'll keep Jeez. Wow. All right. <laughs> on on the list of sus things that Lucas has said on our podcast, a little bit. That one's That's pretty a... up there. Uh, but no, we have a ton of audio listeners, so I think the camera cool. is probably the least of our worries. Uh, yeah. Shane, one thing I don't really know about you is uh, reptile is your full time gig now. Uh no, no, it's uh, never been actually. Okay. A, a lot of people think it is, but it's it has never been. I've been at uh, Cadillac store for 18 years. I'm the service manager there. Um, I operate a pretty good-sized shop. Uh, like I said, I've been there 18 years, so that's my kind of my everyday, all day, all the time, lifetime situation. And then the reptiles are secondary, but also double as a full second full time. So oh, it's there's no days off in my life. No, I, I, I get do. that, and I think that's a big misconception when people look in on some of the, the breeders that they aspire to be and uh, just don't realize that, you know, we do a lot more to sustain these animals than just, you know, have fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's not, it's around-the-clock work. Yeah, and not, and not only that, but, like, also the fact that um, a lot of breeders that people look up to uh, that are doing, like, phenomenal next-level stuff aren't doing this full time. Like this doesn't have to be the full time thing. Right. Um, right. Before we go forward, Shane. So I just wanted to make a, a cut here. Uh, mm -hmm. So I literally can only see your nose and mouth. I don't know if you're aware of that. No, I see yeah. my whole body. That's why I made that comment. There you I go. had so no now, idea. Yeah. So now I can see your face, your hat. I just want to, cause I didn't want to end this entire no. thing. And then you watch the episode and only see your mouth. It, it looks <laughs> like it's from my torso to, I, I can see the top of my cages in this picture. Yeah. Is no, this not right? right? Okay. No, no. Now you look great. Yeah, now we that, have from like, we have like from nipple to forehead now. Yeah. Well, so here, let's do this. I'm going to. Oh, uh Oh, can you can you yep. hear me or no? Yep, 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 yep we got you. Did, did that did that change anything? No, I mean, so no. Right now, I see. Yeah, I see your eyebrows down. So you're good. But this this is not going to be good, guys. My my phone <laughs> keeps going dark. We need to Nate. I'm going to make a, a YouTube re, like we need to make a YouTube real cut with this. Like, <laughs> is this any different? The side wave view? Yeah, oh, no, we got actually, yeah. That's, that's actually a little bit better. It's I, more like zoomed out. Yeah. Oh, so well, actually, that makes sense because we're on a sixteen by nine recording. So yeah, it needs to be sideways. That's probably the best bet. 
I know, but guys, this is not going good. This keeps this keeps making my screen go dark. I don't know why. Uh, and if I hold if I hold my phone like this and I keep tapping it, is this? Can you see any of me here? Yeah, we we got you yeah. good. If you if you lean in every once in a while to tap, that's fine. Um, or or why right. don't we do that? Why don't we do this? If you're comfortable with this, when it goes dim, let it continue mm -hmm. to go, let it continue to go dim. Okay. And and let's see if it actually here it's ends dim. Up... It's it, it's dim right now. So if it cuts out my my screen, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Wait. Can you guys hear out. me? I hear you, but the video is lagging. Yeah, so you're not going to see me on video. My screen is black. Damn it. Okay. Do what you got to do. Even if the viewers just see your lips. <laughs> ah, fuck. That's going to be a super fucking terrible episode for you guys. I'm sorry. I've had, I don't know why this is happening. It's it, the I'll tell you. in the end of the day that matters. Yeah. Well, here, is this any better or worse? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah that's no, fine. we see you great. As long as you have your phone sideways, it's going to work better than it okay. was before. So what I see in the screen is what you see in the screen right now? Yeah. I'm, I could see my a little bit above my yeah. head, yep. just like a selfie, right? Yep. yep. Okay. I will hold my phone. All right. <laughs> I'll be good. The as long as you can see me. Yeah, I don't want to fuck it up for you guys. I mean, so... We're good. It takes a lot for us to be in this moment, so we got to get it to work. Right. <laughs> for real. All right. So, Shane, I want to go ahead and ask you, uh, you know, I've, I've maybe popped in, listened to a couple podcasts that you've done, but I don't think <laughs> I really know everything about it. How did you get into reptiles in general? Like, when, when did that start? What was that journey like for you? Uh, you know, I, I was just a little kid, like uh, probably everybody that's into them still. I, I recently put a picture up of – a picture from 30 years ago of me holding just a, a garter snake that I had caught, you know, and I mean, I don't have memories I, that I can remember from before that, but obviously if I was in a picture with a snake, I must have had them long before that, five, four, you know, but it's not like I wanted them as pets. So obviously those are stuff I caught or my, my friends, older brothers or something saw and you know, caught my attention, whatever I could collect in my yard or collect outside, um, you know, would probably be the, the first time, you know, six, seven. So 30 years ago, really. So just curious kid catching snakes. Yeah. Uh, and then when did you get into like the, the keeping, like the pets, like as far as memory recollection goes, um, like when did that start to be a thing? You know, as a teenager, you know, as soon as I could really start collecting money and, uh, you know, saving money to get them and own them and stuff like that, I was building a collection in my house. Just fish tanks, you know, keeping one of every, you know, one Pac-Man frog, one iguana, one leopard gecko, one garter snake, one corn snake, one box turtle. You know, I went through those phases and I actually started working at a pet store that was in our in my city here. It was my first job. Um, or one of my first jobs, you know, I was young, I was like 16 at the time, but I had worked there for a while and I had, I had some animals I was breeding at that time, leopard geckos, um, different Australian species of stuff, uh, you know, odds and ends, garter snakes. I had bred those, but well, I took them to the store and I was able to sell them through the store that I had worked at. So that kind of started a, you know, opening up a bigger, thought process to the whole thing and and what i was doing that there could be at least some profit to it where they could at least pay for themselves to some degree you know which then funds the hobby you know it's like if you have a race car and you win races and you win money you could make your race car faster and you just right. keep going you know it, it's yeah. no so. different than my friends who sell pot to smoke pot for free <laughs> <laughs> sure yeah look, look, look at it the same way with any hobby. Yeah, I mean, if, right. if you yeah, I mean, sustain if, it by by doing it well, then that's kind of the dream, right? Why not, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the whole program there. Absolutely. So, you know, it started off like that and then it and then it became where um I got to the point where I could start keeping the animals I always wanted, which were retics as I got older, you know. Um I, you know, not terribly much older. Uh, I had lost my parents when I was pretty young, so I was on my own really 
at uh, at about 18, you know, so I was really able to kind of somewhat do what I wanted within reason, I guess, with, you know, so I had bought a quite a bit of, quite a good collection of retics um, because they were the species I want wanted, whether I could breed them or not. You know, the goal was to always one day maybe try to breed them, but they were the species I wanted to keep. So early on, I bought all males. I had a bunch of males from all the different stuff I wanted. Right. So that way I, you know, well, yeah, you know, I, I never, <laughs> bre breeding never really crossed my mind. You know, at first I was just like, well, I wanted them. Uh, you know, I wanted, you know, it's like you get a dog. What, 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 what gender dog are you going to pick? Most guys are going to get a big male, you know, big dog, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of the mindset with it when I first started buying stuff, just get males. So that way I, you know, had pets, you know, had the right pets I wanted. So I can name them what I wanted, you know, call them what I wanted. Yeah. Do you remember so, that, what exactly led you to retics? What what started your fascination there? Um, the the purple albino and I, and obviously the size. You know, seeing the first purples were like they just didn't even uh, didn't even look like like a real animal. They just yeah. didn't even look like a like a living animal. So it was crazy to see it and then to see it live and then actually be able to to get one. Yeah. You know, so it, it was like, oh, my God, like, this is attainable. Like, I, I could actually own this. How long you know? ago was that, roughly? Um, Because, like, now we, we get blown away by a lot well, of crazy. 20 years ago, maybe? I don't know. Yeah. See, that's cool as hell because, like, you know, for someone like uh, myself who's a lot newer in the industry – um, you know, we see purple and we see all these things and it takes a lot to kind of like completely blow our minds. Right. Like a good example, yeah. is, you know, Aubrey producing a, a phantom ocelot like that. I was like, holy shit like that. Right. But like back in the day, 15, 20 years ago, um, yeah, purple, I mean, purple still are phenomenal, but like, yeah, I can imagine just, a yeah. I mean, back then there, there was no, um, there was no extreme albinos or nothing that was like so saturated it would blow your mind. So when those came out, I mean, they had already been out and stuff like that. But, you know, you reach a certain age where you're finally able to find them on the Internet and see them. You know, you just couldn't believe what you were looking at. It's like how now you see some of the, uh, you know, uh, leopard geckos, the pictures that people post of leopard geckos blow my mind I, I i don't know how the leopard gecko guys don't keep every single one of those animals every single one they hatch is like the colors just don't seem like they could exist on a reptile right you know yeah. so but but like you said to the getting mind blown with uh something like a phantom ocelot or the indo ocelot it's like the appreciation is also there for the work it took not just Oh, the yeah. color and the pattern, you know, it's like, man, I, I could really see how long it took to get somewhere. You know, I, I remember uh, seeing Travis Warren made the, the the Mochino anthrax genetic stripe sunfire. Those are insane. And it's like, it's like man, the, the amount of work that it takes to get into that to make one animal and maybe never, you know, never see another one ever again. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. You got to respect the journey for that. And we're going to get into that later today with your journey on that. And that's kind of what I was referring to with that stick to -tiveness. But, and I don't think a lot of buyers really realize that. And they're like, oh, how is this snake $5,000? It's like, oh, because it only took 15 years to make. Yeah. Like, they don't really realize the, the, uh, the, the financial aspect of, raising up those animals to do that for 12 15 years or whatever the case may be let alone just the beauty of it as well yeah yeah it's a it's a lot of work to get a snake from an egg to an adult and see the whole project through it's it's a really long time it's it's at minimum six years really you know to see a full project through or or one specific project through is at least a six year time investment, regardless of the money. Like if you start with a trio of animals, um, is, is really all it takes. If you pick the right three animals and you compound six years into it, 
you could really make some substantial stuff. Even with, you know, if you have the right locality animals, you could do the same thing as you can with like a double recessive. Yep. If you have, you know, the right beginning pair and then a pure female, or like if you have, you know, making het ocelots and I have a raise up female ocelot, you know, that's possible het endocarmal. I have a male sunfire double het OGS ocelot. And then I obviously have a lot of adult female purple OGS combos. Mm-hmm. So I could pick one. You know, I could start the project and do one breeding with that male and make the Sunfire Orange Ghost Stripe 100% Het Purple, probably with either Tiger or Super Sunfire or Jaguar or something like that, and then pick the one that I would be able to try to do my best based off what I've seen that is going to be a Het Ocelot and then breed that back to the female Ocelot all whilst raising the first females I bred the male to, you know, you can ping pong a project pretty strong in like six years yeah. if, you, if you do the right breedings. Yeah. So speaking of your projects, how long did uh, keeping retics for you turn into you making a business out of it and making SC constrictors? And did it go through multiple different name changes, like all, all of the background behind your business? Uh, you, you Wait, so you've been doing this for a while. Just to give everybody a reference – uh, cause that was a great question, but to give everyone a reference, how long have you been like breeding retake since 2012 successfully? Okay. So yeah. like 2011, I, I made some of my first attempts, you know, and failed, but the first successful breeding was 2012. I, we could say 2011 because we all fail, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm with you, okay. Shane. I'll, I'll say 2012. <laughs> so, and I had like. I had even even earlier than that, I had like 1999 head albinos that were like, sorry, some of the big lizards moving around. Um, you know, those were some of my animals that I thought were going to be my first animals I produced anything with, you know, way back then. But I, I had like no idea what I was doing for breeding at that point. And the advice given was either lies, so you didn't learn how to breed. Or there was just no information. Yeah. So. Back, back to Nathan's question. So, like, what was that journey yeah. like? Did you, like, when was SC Constrictors, you know, did it start? Did you go through phases? What was that journey like? Uh, so, you know, I had I had bought and sold quite a lot of animals. Um, just like anyone, you know, you get your taste. You know, you, you, you pick something you like because it looks nice. Some things are impulse buys. Some things are like, oh, I thought I would do really good if I got a male uh, versus a female. And then after a week, you realize you should have got a different gender. So you go through selling it. Um, So it was like trying to pick my projects in the beginning, you know, of what I wanted to actually keep. And I I could never uh, really get my hands on a Sunfire. But once I was finally able to, that is what I, I basically was able to pick the exact animal I was looking for. And that became the whole thing at that. At, when, once I got that in 2009, um, I decided like f- for sure this is what I'm doing. You know, I, I, I need I need to reproduce this animal. I need to I, I have to I wanted to breed retics no matter what, at least once, you know, and I said, if I'm going to do it, it's going to be specifically what I wanted. So that's what I set out to do. So, you know, and I, so I guess in 2009 is when I really said it's time to get serious, you know, and I picked a bunch of the right animals. I started with hatchlings, you know, and raised them up and took the time to do it. So in, in 2012 is when I really created like the SC constrictors brand, I guess you could say in the pages and all that, you know, and um, kind of went away from like, you know, your name is your profile or, or your nickname is your profile on all the forums and on Facebook, you know, and then kind of develop a business name. And um, shortly after that, you know, you saw a lot of people um, because of the platforms of social media, you know, you could create a business name for yourself pretty, pretty easily. You know, you could really start, start creating a name for yourself and 
So a lot of people um, all did the same. I mean, you know, we uh, everyone, I think, had a similar mindset, I, I imagine, to try to get a name for themselves. And, and with Facebook and Instagram, it's, you know, it gave everybody the opportunity and whoever was smart enough to take it, took it, you know, and then, and then it was up to you to take it as far as you could. It's free marketing. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. 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 In, in terms of your marketing, because I, I really admire that. Um, it seems like you've done a lot of it just on your own and uh, you're, you're consistent. So, you know, you, you have your heading and floating epicness is something you see on, on all of your posts and, you know, it's, it's kind of a cool business motto to have. When did that all come around? Uh, you know, it was kind of like a, a mashup of a lot of different things. Like, uh, you know, I've learned a lot working, uh, for Cadillac for a long time. You know, I've been to a lot of big, big marketing seminars and branding things and, and different getting behind your own brand, you know, so I've, I've gained a lot of knowledge outside of just, you know, anything reptile related in general, but also it just, you know, it's very personal. It's, it's personalized to me. Um, I've been very, very big into, um, the tough mutter and obstacle course racing community for a really long time. So, you know, the, the orange and black carries a lot of weight to me. Um, and, you know, a, a big part of my life, you know, my parents' ashes are spread in Florida, and Florida's always been a real special place to me. So that whole, you know, nautical beach theme has just become my way of life. You know, it, it's just, it's, I know it sounds like cheesy shit to a lot of people, I'm sure, but it's, it's, I really am who I am, you know, and I, I call it out, you know, my, my snake room looks like the inside of my jeep looks like the inside of my gym looks like the inside of my room you know looks like the tattoos on my body like you 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 know looks like my snake pictures like you know what you're getting when you call me you know i mean it's i i'm i really have kind of made myself i guess my own uh brand if you will yeah and those little things have stuck out to me and you know you can you can feel that they're personal and you know that that does add a lot of weight to what you're selling i think yeah yeah i mean i I love it you know i i pour my life into it you know i i have my rooms set up to where like i enjoy being in them and they represent what what i put into them and you know i try to keep it where you know the floating epicness thing was kind of a a very late in the game no i I don't want to call it a rebranding but like uh like a refresher you know like um, I made the analogy to one of my buddies, you know, you've, you've got Victoria's secret, but then you have the pink collection and it works, right? You, you've got a very signature look within the same brand. Um, and that's a lot, you know, you pay attention to that type of stuff in, in, in the world, you know, in the clothing world and the, and all that stuff, all the different brands that are out there that do that, you know, we could learn a lot from that. So I, I took a lot away from that you know, um, and it was always the description of, of my animals. So it was just a pretty natural thing to do just, you know, to try to get that in there. So I tried to set it up where it looked like a signature, you know, but also my logo, I guess, you know, so it, it kind of just flowed together. It, it worked out. Okay. Yeah, it works great. So Shane, let me ask you this. Um, obviously we're the retic lounge, so we focus on retics, but we absolutely love hearing about other people's animals that they keep. So what other reptiles, exotic species are you currently keeping, working with, whether it's for pleasure or you are also breeding? Um, yeah, take the floor. Uh, so I've got a pretty, not a huge collection, but a couple racks of ball pythons that I'm specifically working with. I'm sure you've seen Justin Kabilka's Kraken project where it's like a real specific mix of genes, like GHI Mojave, black pastel, Wookie, um, spot noses in there and clown, you know, a lot of the dark genes all coming together in clown. So I just have that one singular project going where I'm, I'm trying to produce animals within that gene pool category and nothing else. 
So, um, you know, I've, I've got a ghost, I've got the ghost gene going in there to work on making like a ghost Kraken animal nice. just for fun. Just, you know, I, I saw that project that caught my attention. Um, I invested into it pretty heavily, got the right animals to try to produce those animals, uh, for my own self and for the future. So it's, it's a really, really long game. You know, I, I project like three to five years before I even like have any ball pythons really for sale, like, you know, much higher end, maybe ball pythons for sale, but it's mostly just for the enjoyment of it to see what I've, what I can hatch. Um, you know, I did ball pythons too long while back, even before the retics, just cause they were more attainable for, you know, 16 year old and, you know, you could just get them wherever. Um, so it was like a lot of unfinished business throughout all my years with retics. Every time I had like a really successful time in retics, I was able to reinvest into different ball pythons that I never could attain earlier and do it just to like, you know, unfinished business to hatch stuff. I always wanted to hatch, you know, and, um, and keep them, you know, as, as a hobby, I have some of the ball pythons I've raised from hatchlings and three, four or five years proven breeders. And, um, so I've bought and sold my ball Python collection probably about seven or eight times over all the years, but finally got just the right group that I want to keep now. Um, I've got that going and then I've got a uh, little bit of success in albino water monitors. I've got a pretty, pretty cool group of like T negative water monitors that, that have taken it a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah, no, seriously, it, um, you got top notch water monitors. You're like, yeah, I got, I got a group of some T negatives. It's, it is so hard to like, uh, it's so hard to not sound arrogant. You know, that's the problem. Everyone's like, oh man, this guy's so full of himself. And it's, it's still, it absolutely blows my mind every single, every day I walk in here and I open these cages and those animals come out. I'm like, there is just no fucking way I hatched this lizard and it's th three years old and this seven foot white albino water monitor. I, 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 there's just, it doesn't even seem real, I you know, and I, I'm not with us right now. He, he would, <laughs> he's so the big females are behind me and they will, they will all get up all worked up and it'll be a disaster. It Not would, a disaster, but it'll bleeding all over yeah, the place. Yeah, yeah, uh, it'll be the them podcast. them trying to yeah, they'll be wanting to party with each other. So what we could we could we could do one day we could just do a quick one. I could pull a few out, but no, it's I I really appreciate the water monitors. It turned out to be a um pretty pretty big bang uh, situation. You know, I I was able to confirm or. I was the first one to produce or breed together a pair of corals unknowingly, unknowingly a pair of corals because the way that they were originally sold was kind of, if you can imagine, um, the female was a T positive possible het T negative and the male was supposed to be a T positive, a hundred percent het T negative, um, believing they were like non-compatible lines of albino. So no one had ever bred a pair of them together, but those animals did exist, but everybody called them crosses, um, both in Indonesia and here, the breeders that worked with them. So I raised, uh, raised them up, got a clutch of eggs and, you know, always joke like, man, imagine if they both proved out as T positive had T negatives. Um, so my first egg was a T negative and I, I, I had called actually Aubrey. I had literally called Aubrey. I mean, weeping, crying, 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 like unconsolably crying, freaking out, hatched a T negative, couldn't fucking believe it. Um, you know, and then as all the eggs started to hatch, realized that they were all albinos. Um, and then I got trick. all three, all three phases of albino that perfectly broke down. Like if you bred an orange glow to an orange glow or a mochino to a mochino. Or in ball pythons, you know, the toffinos or candinos or, yep. or all those. So um, I had a whole ton of support. And then I had a bunch of people that were like, this is bullshit. You're crazy. 
Um, <laughs> of course. So, because when people do awesome things, there's always going to be those haters. Yeah, and you know it, it does suck because there was another guy in the in the um, in Indonesia actually that has he and he put in his work a lot of serious work and uh, he did not believe me at all and kind of bashed me a little bit on his website and you know posted our conversations and and all that. Um, it was me trying to explain to him not being a dick, but like, Hey man, um, I've kind of discovered of what this and this is. I'm letting, you know, just sharing information and stuff. I mean, it's no threat to me. We're not in each other's marketplace. It doesn't even really, you know, matter, but he did not like that. So we did not get along. Unfortunately, um, he did pass away unrelated to reptiles in any way he had passed away from like pneumonia um but i had found out because after we had had our words we you know i had no reason to ever communicate with him again but someone had said hey, go check his website well he totally ate his words and changed all his website to coral and and really? did and in fact end up agreeing with what i had said so I wish we had maybe squashed our beef. It's sad to hear if anyone passes away. You know, I mean, we weren't like at each other's throat. It was just a big difference of opinion because I was kind of like some guy who had just bred water monitors and uh, had crazy huge success right away. And and some people don't care for that. That's in, no, I mean, it's literally insane what you did. And I now that you're mentioning the coral and everything, it wasn't even on the forefront of my mind, but it kind of brought it back to like working memory. I remember seeing those posts. Um, and, um, yeah, no, that, that's pretty awesome. I've, I've always, I don't know about you, Nathan. Uh, well, I know Nathan definitely enjoys and wants to keep certain species of monitors, but, um, mm -hmm. there's just something about Niles and water monitors that, mm -hmm. uh, or, or not now, but water monitors and croc monitors, um, that yeah. are, uh, just that prehistoric intelligent it like, is man it's i'll own monitors so at some crazy. point but not anytime soon yeah they're they're really cool they're they're a lot of work but it, they're so rewarding it's so rewarding to mm -hmm. to, to work with them um you know i i've got a really long-term project with water monitors going where i bred a sulfur to a coral so it's a double recessive but similar to breathing like an orange glow to a normal, you don't know if you have a het albino or het caramel. So I don't know if I have a het T negative or het T positive and het sulfur. So I've got I've got I've got a whole stack of cages over there with with a bunch of double hats. So I've got to figure out which males are carriers of what and what females are to try to hit a coral sulfur and a T negative sulfur those are the plans or the goals but it, it's a huge undertaking though but that's like you know same philosophy as i did with my retics you have to do your double head breedings very 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 early and just set them up and they're your pets for five years just raise them up and take care of them and you you gotta forget about them you gotta just raise them as as pets don't worry about trying to get them to breed right away. Just long term. You have to think very long term. Got to enjoy the process. And that's what I, yeah, think, a lot yeah. of, I think a lot of people miss that and then don't, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the whole, you know, world's first craze. And I mean, even people now in terms of, uh, uh, I mean, like I, I'll even admit this and, and a little bit guilty of it. Right. But I'm like, I'm so excited to produce Superdorf head ocelots. Hopefully I'll be able to do that this season. Everything's looking yeah. good for that. But like, you know, I, I, I'm like, I'm starting to like, where is the female going? What's going on? He's not arching. He arched last year, blah, blah, blah. And then I like, sometimes I get in my garage and I'm like, I have an ocelot. Like, like that, that yeah. like life is good. Um, yeah. And so slowing down and just enjoying the process, I think is a very important part of it. Yeah. It, it takes a lot of time. You know, I see, too many people start a project and they just never finish. Um, that's the hardest. That's the hardest, I think, on me. Like, I sometimes scratch my head as to how some stuff has still not been made or why certain stuff took so long to make or, you know, like, uh, 
sometimes you see somebody hatch something and then they sell the offspring and other people beat them to their own project. Um, you know, it's uh, the world first thing that that craze is, you know, one of the biggest driving factors as to why almost everybody decided to like really start breeding retics if they weren't about the money. Nobody just wanted 30 extra pets. You know, they wanted to make something that they thought they could make before anybody else. Right. Is one one huge course everybody took. And the other course was like 60 eggs times a thousand dollars a piece is 60 grand <laughs> times a hundred females. I'm going to be a millionaire in one year. I so those that are the, the, that's the math. That's the exact reptile breeder math. I yeah. promise you yeah. that is the math. Well, no, yeah. it is. So, so like if you, if you can do, you know, um, and the people that are like, well, you, you have some truth to like, well, I just want them to pay for themselves. Then those are the people that you can kind of tell that are only breeding like one clutch. And they're like, I could trade a couple. I could sell three or four. Um, I'll keep three or four or, you know, they, they decide what to do, but like they only do it one time to say they did it and then they stop, you know, right. so there's a lot of different types of breeders out there, you know, and, um, I push the envelope pretty hard for, for the world first stuff, but, you know, also to, to make my own collection though, also like I, my collection is like 90% animals I produce myself. That's awesome. So I, I did it to like fill my own cages with the animals I made. That's why I take a lot of pride when I'm like, this is a sixth or seventh generation animal or a, you know, a, a five year old fifth generation or seven year old animal or, you know, something that I can, you, made you know, that say post I have on had Facebook. Some... Yeah. You made that post on uh, that post on Facebook that you showed almost like what an end result project looked like. And, and you posted each year of the generations on there. And I thought that that was so cool to just see unfold. Um, but let, yeah. let me ask you this. And I know that this is kind of fast forwarding a little bit on, on what we were uh, going to, but I feel like we're on the topic um, because you talked about the different type of breeders, right? You talked about mm -hmm. the, the, you know, one plus one equals a million. Um, and yeah. then you talked about, you know, the pain for your, uh, hobby and trying to go for the world's first, but I want to know your thoughts on like, um, like, do you think where the market is right now and all that kind of stuff, like, where do you stand on like a true selective breeding for higher quality animals versus being the catch all retic breeder that does a little bit of everything and sells a lot of snakes? Like, do you not like that model or are you okay with that model? We obviously know which one you prefer. Um, um I, you know, there's a lot of different aspects to answer that. There's people who, there are some people who just want to produce a lot of animals and go sit at a reptile show with 60 babies for sale. And that might be what they, what their version of, of this is, you know, and that's okay if, if, but, but if, there's there's different markets there, right? There's the guys that do shows, whereas like, you you know, those are not the same guys that have those same animals really listed on a website for sale. Maybe, you know, um, it's it's only when there's like the mix of um, of interest there, where there's some people trying to do it, where they're just mass producing, um, just to produce an a unit to sell you know yeah. there's people that are doing that and of course it'd be nice to tell everyone to like throttle back and and hey you can have success only breeding one or two clutches a year you know probably even more success because also your overhead and your costs are very low or I've been preaching in that for a while they're very high but in comparison they're very low to the person that has you know 10 <laughs> <clears throat> 10 12 15 clutches coming a year i mean that's a lot of that's a lot of animals you know and i've i've always yeah, uh not like me. you said you know it's it's obvious what i've chosen i mean i've only done um sorry i'm just making sure this camera's all right guys um 
you know, I've really never done more than I've only done four clutches, I think two times in all my years. And I think my average is usually two to three. Um, you know, if you have a hundred percent successful year, I typically try to aim to breed five females or try to get five females to go because I know at least one of them is a hundred percent not going to go. And likely the a second one won't either. Yep. And then the second one is going to hang you out for a really long time and she might or might, might not. And then you're going to have, you know, three girls. And then of those three girls, you're going to have one, you know, go super late or one go super early. So if you have three clutches that you aim to get together, you very rarely will get them together. So then you'll have like a breeding season and you'll have a good, you'll have a good group of hatchlings, you know, where you can like open. It, it's like a bakery that opens up in the morning. They've got enough donuts to sell till 10 o'clock and they shut the doors. That's it. Like I don't want to have snakes available all year long, every day of the year. You know, I, I, that's too I, much sales work, man. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It is a lot. It's a tremendous amount, but also that, then, then I have to say, well, well, what do you say to the people that do do this full time? They need to have snakes for sale every day of the year. So it's, um, you know, I can't tell someone that isn't in my position to do it the way I do it if they're in their position and they need to do it a different way. So it's, it's really hard to get everyone to agree on what is right for the retic market in general. Right. You right. Know? Uh, any thoughts on that, Nathan, on that perspective? I had a couple, but I wanted to pick your brain on that, Nathan, in terms of like the right or wrong version. I mean, just at the end of that, I mean, if I'm thinking about trying to make a profit in the reptile industry, I don't automatically go to one of the largest constrictors. I think there's more ethical ways to make your money in the reptile industry. If that's all you're about doing is just being in this industry and producing animals. You can yeah, the prob the yeah, problem was er early on, man, with the retics, with, oh, yeah. with the, the size of them and the amount of eggs they could lay. And then you had Jay Brewer with $120,000 retics for sale on his website. Yeah. So anybody, any kid, you know, the first, you know, it's a, a million dollar car. You, you know, that's your dream. But then, you know, you could get sold your dream for way less, but then you're like, well, what happens when I want to sell that snake for $125,000? Oh, wait, they don't actually sell for that money. Shit. Right. You know? But the problem is everybody got crazy with like these animals lay a tremendous amount of eggs. Right. And it was you get rich really quick because by by reptile math. Right. Yeah. It, right. That was the whole reason retics got out of hand, I I think, you know. I mean Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So. And I mean I, going back to that right or wrong, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? Like it's hard to like tell someone who shoes that were not filling right to say that right. you know to you know and i mean at the end of the day whether you are doing this for profit you know but obviously you care about the animals right or or you're doing it for you know the the different aspects that you covered the only i don't think it's wrong if you have a lot of retics as long as they're kept <laughs> ethically responsibly and you have the the staff to help you whatever the case may be it's it's when we start to prioritize um, monetization and production over uh, the the life of the animals that we're creating. Well, right, you know, and and people who are wanting to make a name for themselves, you know, mon money is the byproduct of of hard work in a lot of cases. So, if you're working really hard at this and you're keeping your animals correctly and you're doing the right thing, you're going to be successful. Yeah. And you're going to produce animals. Um, and I think I, I, I don't think everybody started with like the money factor, but like now as we've evolved, the same guys that I started with, if they're still around 15 years later, obviously the hobby itself is keeping them there. But if their name is still relevant in the, in the marketplace, 
then obviously the money is keeping it. It's funding the fun. You know, it's, it's funding the process. You know, if your business was sucking and you were pulling money from somewhere else to keep this failing business failing, you're like, well, I'm going to hang it up, man. I'm done. But, you know, if you have a couple, you have a couple good seasons and you don't, you know, feel like you're, you know, rich and you run out and buy, you know, a bunch of animals, you know, just, you just start blowing all your reptile money on everything. And then you're like, well, shit, you know, what if you're not successful again the next year? You have to pace it out, you know, and spread it out. But the people who are, are earning money, it's, it's keeping their business going along with their love for the animals. Cause if you didn't love retics, dude, you'll be out of retics in a six oh, months. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. not even they yeah. suck. They're, yeah. they're, they're very, very, very hard animals they to suck. keep. They, they do. They're, they're, they're just like, they're on self-destruct mode almost all the time. Retics <laughs> are just, they're crazy. So they're, 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 that's, they're, a, that's a good segue into what we're going to be talking about next. So <laughs> in terms of them being on self-destruct, like, and just you being in this for so long, seeing some of the different evolutions in retic keeping, uh, mm-hmm. what's kind of your husbandry practices today? Yeah. I'm curious um, about that too. Like, what do you do in terms of, uh, caging temps, humidity, whatever. Most everything I do now is, is a, exact version of what i did when i when i really started just on a much bigger scale you know i've i've still got some of the same vision cages i bought from my first uh tinley park show in like 2004 you know back when they were um, affordable yeah back when you could roll you know get a, a six foot cage for 400 bucks you know it was i mean i'll put it to you this way i don't i've i was able to pick up 632s for 200 bucks Okay. all the time all the time that pisses all me the off time. i don't even want to continue this discussion that pisses me off. we have four four hundreds and four twenty twos for like 150 bucks it was crazy man it, but you know i am um i'm a very ocd person outside of reptiles so like everything i have is very very set a certain way um so I'm pretty meticulous with my animals. You know, they're living animals. So if someone's like, my room's clean 100% of the day, all day, all the time, every day, there's just, it's not a physically capable thing. And, and you, you know, if you pull one of my two buildings tubs somewhere, there's going to be a fresh turd or a turd, you know, a, a spilled water bowl or, oh, you know. But it's, it is a continuous everyday effort, you know, to run an appropriate size collection for one person. Yep. Um, you know, so I do run belly heat. I've, I've not ever given in any, um, ability to do the ambient. I've talked to Aubrey a lot about the ambient temps and I tried that. He got me switched over and I love it. Now I sweat my ass off when I clean, but uh, I got fans running. So once I sweat and my shirt's wet, it, the fans keep yeah. me cool. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, uh, what what's your thoughts on that ambient? Um, I, I'm not saying I have anything really against it. I just I don't know it enough to trust it enough to switch my whole program. Yeah, you've been doing. You this know, a while. it's a it's a high risk move to like attempt. Um, I will say because of being in the Midwest, I do let the summer I, I kind of do run like a hybrid ambient heat through the summer. I mean, Aubrey and I spoke about that to do that this year. So I did do that somewhat. Um, but I try to keep my room really most of the year at about 72 to 75. I, okay. I keep it kind of like my house, like kind of yeah. pretty comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. I did the same thing but, when I was keeping on gradient. But I but I rely on my, you know, <clears throat> undertaking heat and, and stuff like that to keep it where I want it. But that's I've just always done it that way. Um yeah. you know, to it gives me a, a little bit more of a individual animals control because I've got a probe on every female. Each What's female's got its own eighty eight. Eighty eight. 
Cool. I like, I like to hear that for someone yeah. that's been keeping for a while. Cause I know a lot of people that have been doing this a long time still keep at like 90, 91. And I've Ooh. never, I've, I've never had success with that, man. Little secret. It's usually 86. Yeah. Um, they retics can be kept considerably cooler than I think most people think, but, Oh yeah. Um, I've not the there's there's reasons to counteract all of it, and my biggest thing is also my my feeding system is pretty much no lump meals or really minimal lump meals for them. Um, I really don't like giving these animals these like you know where they're just gorged out like lumpy and Laying bumpy. Sideways. And <laughs> I I understand they are fully evolved and built to do exactly that but when they have two pound pigs available on infinity they i don't need to i just i'm not knocking it god bless all the guys that feed huge stuff i mean i've fed a 40 pound deer to a snake before i'm all about it Holy i've just shit. i've just changed <laughs> i've just i've just changed i've changed my feelings on it i've gathered new information and i've changed my opinion i just don't like having that big of a meal in their body because too many things can go wrong while that meal is inside of them and oh, yeah. that stresses me out so i don't want to risk you know my own mental well-being while i'm watching this snake with a camera live all day every day till this giant meal oh you do that you know, too goes down <laughs> oh god you know it's uh it, it's just a lot on the animal you know and the same thing goes for my water monitors and my ball pythons i have got three thousand gram adult ball pythons that have never eaten anything bigger than a medium rat oh, like nice. it just just small meals they, they all still grow you know they, they it's it's a it's time and it's time it's it's longevity you know, is yeah. what it is. Yeah, I so. mean, you can look at it the same way almost as uh, feeding frozen thawed. We do it more for the peace of mind for us. Right, yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, and even going back to the comment about, you know, they can probably go cooler than 86. Um, you know, I do keep ambient and, uh, you know, Aubrey was someone I talked to that was monumental in helping me set up my parameters and, uh, same with Cody. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they struck a balance, 81, 84, 82, 84, right? With a mini split, it's definitely going to fluctuate throughout that, throughout the yeah. day. But um, yeah. I, I even started experimenting and, and uh, you know, my highs only get to 84, but my average temp is like 82. But night times this year, I decided to try yeah. it out and I really like what I'm seeing and finding. But I, I at night, um, I, I dropped my garage down the last like two weeks. I've dropped my garage down to like 77, 78. Nice. And that, that's, that's again, no external heat source. It's just them chilling. Well, when I said I kind of do like a hybrid deal, you know, I do move my females from top to bottom. Also, the room gradient itself, just the natural heat gradient. And my males, I pull them. I have racks with no heat at all. So when I have males that are going to go into the breeding program, I move them. You know, um, I talked about on a different podcast, maintaining a collection for what its purpose is. Like I, I can maintain a, only a certain amount of animals in the fashion in which I keep them to make sure, like you had said, is it, a, is it an ethical breeding setup? You know, am I able to supply a 12 foot cage for each animal? No, but be, that's because I have a higher volume of animals that is done in almost like a laboratory style setup. So each animal has its own individual program going on in one big program, but it's super OCD and uniform, like you laboratory like style. You literally sound it's, like Nathan. That's Nathan all right there. <laughs> yeah. I, I keep so, it really small. I, I keep meticulously like if, if you, like you said, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to have it clean a hundred percent of the time, every hour of the day, but but pretty damn so, close. Not yeah. Dirty. So like everything is getting cleaned and cycled out. And yeah. So like how a zoo has an on exhibit off exhibit, I have cages that are empty for animals that are in tubs to move into cages during their life cycle. You know, um, 
they always have different requirements throughout their life, and they all always want different things. If we have the ability to provide them, um, you know, people, the big thing that's come up recently is the enrichment thing where, like, you know, we really want to give these animals a lot to do. But what if I am the one doing the a lot of enriching with them myself hands on all day? Right. It's like the, the, the guys who have working dogs, they work their dogs all day and those dogs sit in a kennel. They're not on a couch eating Cheetos with six kids. You know, it's there's very different lifestyles for these animals. Right. It just depends on what you can ethically do to properly care for them and their health and their condition, you know, um, I'm going to make a comment on that. And I know that I wanted to get to this kind of towards the end of the episode in regards to uh, kind of this new wave of keep of, of people coming in with retics that are, are going naturalistic, that are going way bigger than people have historically. And, and I think yep. we've kind of debunked the myth that people believed back in the day of like, you know, retics like small enclosed areas. And because if you give them all the space in the world, they'll take it. But, but um. I want to hear your thoughts about kind of that, that movement, what's your thoughts about that. But before I kind of wanted to make a point, it seems like in today's like, like zeitgeist today's world right now, a lot of people are very quick to judge breeders in regards to just size of enclosure alone for their retakes. Now I, I get it. Like it's not, it's not fun to see a, a 12 foot snake in a four foot cage or a 18 foot snake in a six foot, like, I get what they're saying from there, but when it comes to like husbandry practice and the animal's well-being and health, that person who's keeping a snake in a six and eight foot enclosure that maybe they want to see in a 12 foot enclosure, they're saying like, oh, well, that's that's horrible of them to do. But they don't understand that a lot of other people are taking these animals out. They're working with them. These animals are getting <laughs> exercise. Like they're so yeah. I just want to make that comment to people listening that there is so yeah. much more than just cage size that matters. Like cage size is important, but like the animal's lifestyle, which is different from breeder to breeder, uh, is equally as important. Yeah, you know, there's a um a lot to that where the people who are coming in who do want these big, nice enclosures, um, it's phenomenal. It's awesome. It, it's it's very refreshing to see people finally wanting to do that for retics. Um, but you have to decide what comes with the territory of what you're wanting to do. If I had four retics, I would have four walk-in bedroom, right. huge you know, waterfall. I mean, they would be like a zoo, you know, but I'm also the guy that is supplying the snake to that guy to go in that cage. You know, that's, that's where my place is in this hobby because that's where I made it starting 20 years ago. You know, if I wanted to just be a keeper, I would have kept, you know, like I kept way, way back. You know, everything was naturalistic. Everything was, you know, set up to like self-sustain to some level. I'm not going to say it was all bioactive. It was just, you know, it was it was the elementary level setup, you know, rookie level setup. Um, but now, all these years later, grown grown adult, all these years in the hobby, I would have a fully functioning reptile enclosure for retics if I had. Like if you said tomorrow all my retics are gone and I could keep four of them. They would each have, you know, their own uh, habitat, you know, a whole uh, ecosystem to themselves. But right, it does come down to the quality of the life of the animals. You know, it's I've got my hands on my collection sometimes more than some people have their animal on one or two snakes. Right. You know, so. Right. Yeah. Now, That's far let too me... common in this industry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Now, um, I'm going to pause real quick. Shane, you doing OK on time? Yeah, yeah, I'm all okay. right. Okay, cool. Probably just... check in maybe around 11:30 or something. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure because I wanted to start yeah, dipping no. into the 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 meats and potatoes part. Yep. Um. So, Shane, I one thing that like stood out to me, and I can't remember when I said this or or, or when I heard this, where I read it. Um, you mentioned just back in the day working with Sunfire. And you've gotten to a point where you are known for making 
phenomenal Sunfire crosses. Um, and I, what, what are your thoughts on that term? That uh, did you create the term? Did other people that the term Shane Fire? No, I, I did not. No, um, that was a point where you, I got to be honest. I can't even remember who exactly said it first, but there was a point where. If you notice, every other species of animal, people have no problem naming every morph, you know? I oh, mean, ball pythons could, is insane. Oh, my God, man. It, it's nuts, right? Well, for the retic guys, you were just shunned out of the world if I you try to name a morph, right? So sometimes I have nicknamed morphs like, oh, the snake catch, it looks like it's got pineapples on the side of it. And I physically name the snake pineapples. Well, people think a motley super tiger is called pineapples. That's the morph. Yep. It's it it just it's not. It just it's a nickname that I gave it just because the pattern looked like fucking pineapples on it. You know. But, but hold on. Um, yeah, I have on. a I have a purple albino right now that it its pattern literally says poop, so I call it the poopal albino. There you right. go. But but, but hold up. Why but why the don't sun we do that? Fire, well, why, why don't we why don't we do that in the retic industry though? Because like for example, in the ball python industry, you know, a four gene animal is given a new name, and now we have a single name to identify what is a four gene animal instead of calling something in the retic world a plot a uh, platinum motley tiger, uh, sunfire, uh, OGS het purple, right? Like all like we have yeah. to like I'm supposed to list it like that's that's like twenty five key like number. I know it's it's so weird. It's hard because you'll get half the people to accept it, and the other half of the people will say no. You know, it's um, it's like we accept saying the word snow, right? right. But we don't right. want, but we don't want to say an anery purple. You know, it's like I Pick know. I, I I really don't know if you if you want the truth. What I think is in the very beginning when Jay was doing it, Jay named like every even a hat. He was making names for everything, and everyone's like. We're never naming, open. yeah. We're never naming them. We're never naming names, and then we just never did. I mean, I really, just, that's kind of how it went. I already decided when I, I, because I'm working with the the tiger ocelot project. Uh, you know, I have tiger head ocelots right now that I produced, um, and I've already seen what a tiger ocelot looks like, but we haven't seen many of them yes. produced. They're Man, they're phenomenal. That's a good looking snake. Yeah. The black and white contrast. I already decided when I produced them. I'm going to call them stormtroopers. <laughs> it's going to be a good looking snake, man. It, it really is. So let's get back to sun or Shane Fire. Sure. So so you know somebody uh, somebody said it. It was one of my buddies, but it was in in a combat argument, some argument for something else. Everyone just beating their chest. But I've never called my stuff Shane Fires. There's people that have. It's it it's appreciated, sure, you know, but I never tried to like coin that, you know, to like make it anything. But it's appreciated. You know, it, it's nice to know they stand out, you know, it just something that I, I think there was an argument going on with the guys not giving credit to the people who had produced something long before them, you know, and you, you can only give credit so many generations. Like, should we all just thank the first guy that imported the first retic every time we post a picture? Post a I gotta thank Bob. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like how, how, how many years, how many years do I have to put in before I could start thinking my fucking self? You know, that's why I do list five, six, seven, eight generations because I'm thanking me because I'm the one doing the work, you know. Right. I I appreciate Ford for building a car, but if I'm putting a thousand horsepower in it, I'm not writing a letter to Ford thanking them. You know, I mean, it's <laughs> so. I like. Yeah, that. It, it's nice to see that appreciation. I'm sure it speaks. Yeah. It speaks volumes to the the yeah. level of selective breeding that you've maintained. Thank you. Speaking of selective breeding. My favorite stuff that I, I I cannot wait to see one in person someday. And I know I've talked to you and I've inquired about it. And, uh, you know, it's definitely on my radar. Um, but this whole um, OGS purple and, you know, the Sunfire just takes it to another level. They have a 
orange highlighter look, at least in pictures. And people say they even look better in person. Um, and that's part of a project that you have done for several generations. Um, I, I want to leave this question open-ended because I, I want our listeners to kind of get an inside look into your brain on the direction you took, why you went that route. But I, I just want you to tell us about that project, how you got to where it's at. Did you see it turning out like that? And then I also want to kind of let our listeners know, like, what's the future of that project? Like, where, where are you <laughs> taking that? So, um, you know, it started back, like I had mentioned in 2009 when I had picked up my first Sunfire and it, it does go down to the very root of why do you drive the car you drive? You must, you know, you must buy what you like and if you like it and you're willing to invest in it, you know, it's the best thing you ever bought, you know, but you have to love it. Some people love, you know, their old beat up car and some people love their brand new car off the show you know, floor, you know, the floor. So I, I started with the Sunfires and what I wanted to do or what I thought I could do is, is try to make the best of that particular one, you know, through selective breeding. And there's a lot of genes out now, but back, you know, in 2009 or so, there was not that many genes out there. And plus there was no, even albino versions of a lot of the morphs that we see today. So we were like, we didn't even know what to expect with a lot of different stuff. You know, we thought the first albino golden child, purple golden child was going to be just a gigantic purple snake. That was it. I mean, it was the biggest upset in the hobby ever. Which is is crazy because I heard how they look. (laughs) Yeah. You know, they look great, but imagine, I mean, I, I know. I mean, I wasn't physically there, sure, but like, you know, as live as social media is, I was there the day that the first albino golden childs were getting hatched, and it was like, wait, these aren't all purple, like a completely purple snake, yeah. you know. So it was like, holy shit, we really are just beginning to learn, you know, a lot of stuff. So, um, orange ghost stripe was always the holy grail. It was the only recessive that was like the best recessive it was the untouchable you just you unattainable you couldn't get one you could never get one out of nerd it was just an untouchable animal right so i i just i wanted one you know more than anything you know i had had my sunfires i had a male sun tiger and a female sunfire and you know, if you could imagine in 2009 getting a female orange ghost stripe and a male GCOGS was a large, you know, jump into that project, you know, but I had a very, very just specific goal just to get those genes to be together. You know, and I had had my purple. I had started with my 2009 purple and my 2009 Sunfire that was possible had purple. So, like, I had had my founding genes already set in place of what I wanted to make, you know, and that was always the plan from from 2009 till today is to make purple, orange, ghost stripe Sunfire. It goes back to kind of that first bit of advice that you made at the beginning, just to- find that perfect trio of what you want to work with. Yeah. You know, too many people don't follow through on their own project. They do one breeding, they make hats and then they get distracted by something else and they either buy that and focus on that animal and then forget they have all these hats and then just like sell them or forget about them or they they've sold some already and the other guy has them on the fast track and produces what that other guy was trying to make. And he's like, well, this project sucks. Now I, you know, right. they, they, you've got to invest in your own project. Otherwise nobody else is ever going to, wouldn't you want to, you know, if you were to buy a Corvette, wouldn't you want to see somebody with a, a 3000 horsepower Corvette and be like, if I buy this Corvette, I could also do that. You know? So if you buy a purple OGS, I would like to be 
so far ahead that you can have the opportunity to see a purple orange ghost stripe super sunfire or a purple motley you know jaguar sun tiger ogs like not not that i would ever want to do all those jeans but you get what i'm saying like i also though want to do the work where i'm like hey guys don't do this this sucks this combo sucks like i did a lot of super gc you know i well not a lot but i did my homework and produced two very well documented super golden child clutches and my advice is never breed golden child to golden child again. And guess what? You don't see people doing that because I hope to God they maybe listen to me. But it wasn't like I was trying to be arrogant. It was just I did some homework. Here's the bad results. Let's not do this anymore for the sake of the hobby. You know? Yeah. So. Lucas, do you maybe want to – I know you want to touch on Jaguar a little bit and maybe that kind of segues into yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, he he mentioned it. So first and foremost, um, Jaguar, um, for any of you that don't know that are listening, um, Jaguar is like up there in my top three favorite codoms, right? Um, it, it's it's a awesome looking animal. But of course, with Jaguar, there's the wobble aspect, the neurological issues. There There's some theories that it's not neurological. It's more of like an inner kind of like an ear misbalance ordeal. But anyways, whatever the case it may be. Um, I, I kind of want to know, um, can, can you speak about your experience working with Jaguar mutation and kind of just give us your thoughts in regards to like, um, your comments in regards to ethically breeding these type of animals and selling them, knowing that they have these neurological issues. There's a <laughs> lot of people that are, um, you know, either against it. There's some that are like, ah, they're beautiful and make great pets. And I, I kind of just want to get your inside look into sure, that sure. whole discussion. So, um, firstly, the gene itself is one of the best. It's one of the best incomplete dominant genes. I mean, it does complement every single combo it has ever been in. And by itself, it's killer. In every albino form, it's unbelievable. It is like... Uh, like it, it's it's in my top four or five. I mean, it's it really is. I mean, you know, you have to look at your breeding projects of what genes complement each other. That's why Sunfire and OGS was to me at the time a no-brainer, and then make it purple. But Jaguar has come into my uh, system pr pretty heavy, and I actually went through a lot of Jaguars when I first started getting them because of how bad the wobbles were. Um, some would not eat. Some could not eat. They couldn't find the head of the animal. They couldn't strike. They were so – they would just corkscrew out of control. Um, they were pretty nasty, pretty pretty bad. So um, I sold them, obviously. I you know I had gotten rid of them all. I went through probably, I think, eight – I think around eight animals before I landed on, like, getting the exact animals I wanted – to use in my breedings, but um, I'd like to believe the quality of my documentation of stuff is is pretty high, you know. So like, oh, I've had a lot of jaguars, but I've not just had a lot of jaguars. I've I've spent ex nauseating amount of hours with all of my jaguars to learn about all of them and what makes them do what they do. And the Jaguar has the wobble for like three different reasons. It's it's like a neurological trigger or a tick. And they either do it when they're really mad, like when the snake's just an aggressive snake, like the snakes that flatten their heads out, that are just mean, just, just a mean retic, a mean animal. They all wobble horribly. So that animal already has something going bad for it because it's mean and it has an exaggerated wobble because it's so mean that trigger of the aggressiveness just makes them loopy. They're, they're, they're never calm. So they're always flapping. I mean like out of control. So those yeah. animals all got cut out of the program. And then you have a second type of wobble, which comes from a feeding response. 
Yeah. Like an like like a good excited hunting wobble because of that like neurological call it an endorphin rush or whatever. It's like the fainting goats, you know, it's whatever triggers them. Yeah. So so you have that wobble that comes from like a good feeding response. That is the one that like you want them to have because that is the one that can be overcome because typically then those animals the the third type is like the non-aggressive we're back after some technical difficulties so we actually are having to record on a separate day first time that's ever happened to us here uh we almost lost the entire episode so fortunately for you guys we don't have to have a fake episode um, yeah, make lightning strike twice that kind of thing it's it's never yeah. the same the second go around right uh shane well, we were talking about jaguars yes we uh, had last left off at the three different types of wobbles that i've seen the jaguars have first one was aggression uh which we covered second one was the feeding response um and the third one kind of really tallies on with that it's it's excitement and the only way I could really relate it would be like if you have a dog that is excited to see you, they pee on the floor, right? Or they, you know, flip out. They 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 just go nuts. You know, the fainting goats are kind of like that too. They they do it from fear, but sometimes if they're excited too in a good way, they pass out. So yeah. I've got nice jaguars that are like tame. They're able to handle. Uh, I could have them out for as long as I need. Videos, pictures. Uh, no issues. They're like the most chill animals in, in some of my breeding groups. And those animals have no wobble. I almost can't even get them to wobble. The only way I can get them to is, is with the food. So it's like an, ex, an extreme excitement situation. And typically it's them going from just a sitting dormant state, not actively looking for food. I open the tub they're probably asleep, right? We can only assume when these snakes are asleep most of the time. So they kind of are disoriented for a quick second, and then they figure out exactly what's going on, and they narrow in. But if the snakes are up and active, and they're not, you know, extremely hungry, looking for food, crazy at the front of the cage, they come out and they strike right on target. They, they can crawl right on over to wherever they need to be. They can perch themselves. They reach out and grab, you know, and can hang upside down and, and you know, do all the different things that retics would do with no problems. But I've had other ones long time ago that were like so gnarly. They, they would like, just like flip flop almost just beyond corkscrewing, you know, and those animals either perished cause they physically couldn't eat. They couldn't thrive. They, they couldn't find the head of the rat, you know? Um, so it's like they lost a lot of motor skills. Those animals though are, are long gone. I mean, there's, there should be none of that anymore left. You know, if people are still breeding to somewhat a selective situation where if you had a huge clutch and five of them were like upside down and then 10 of them weren't, I'd right. hope you'd pick from the, from the right group, you know, and sometimes it's about not even about taking the color, you know, um, you know, cause selective breeding too, if you only hatch one of something, you, that's your that's your baseline. You have no choice but to keep it back for many reasons other than just just the looks. You know, maybe you don't know. Maybe it's not the best one. You know, right? That's well, the goal. We started. You were talking about besides just selectively breeding for the wobble, which obviously you want gone, but uh, mm -hmm. even attitude. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just the just your typical. You know, it, it goes hand in hand with people that would breed dogs. Why would people continue to breed aggressive dogs? You'll, you'll, yeah. Aggressive snakes make aggressive snakes. I mean, the pied gene was the worst, I think. And I've been around a pretty long while to see a lot of new genes come in and come out and get bred and, and really flourish. And the pieds were just the most mean chainsaw aggressive animals. That was their reputation for a really long time. Now... Everyone's got pides on their shoulders and pides at reptile shows and mm -hmm. pides with the kids. And, you know, we've yeah. done our work, you know, we've done the right work to breed that in. So, you know, yeah, it, spider it ball sense. pythons, you know, are still I, around, I was, right? 
Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, and um, I, I was gonna say that that like what you're talking about that excitement, uh, physiological like arousal, right? Anytime that that like mm-hmm. uh, central nervous system is kind of like kicked in, you know, fight, flight, or freeze, or or you know any of the other things that excite you know the brain that stimulates the brain. Yeah. Um, I had a partho clutch from my wild caught at Kalatoa. And um, some of the babies in the clutch, you know, they hatched and they came out of the egg, but they had a very wobble-like feature. And there was um, there was a few that, you know, would keep feeding and had a very minor issue. And, um, you know, I, as they would get used to me coming in and holding it and picking it out, I mean, it, it's to the point where the one I still have in the rack right now is, um, you know, you, you barely even notice it. Um, strike yeah. and find everything, and it, it was so. It's one of those things where I think also, if it's like they a defen- yeah, it's it's like a defensive thing. If they're defensive, if they're nervous and scared, and you do everything in your power to uh, have it associate you with not having to be nervous or scared, you know the the chances of witnessing the wobble dramatically decrease. Yeah, you you have to induce it. You have to like forcefully try to get them to wobble. You know, so. Off the Jaguar topic and on to another topic, I wanted to talk to you about um, you started getting into the Superdorf game. What led yeah. you to what led you to that decision? And um, you, you, man, I remember the first animal you posted when you got back into the when you got into the Superdorf game was that insane snow that literally is like mm-hmm. white and silver in that picture. Yeah, phenomenal animal. Uh, but what what got you into it and? Uh, you know, what direction do you plan to head in? So it's, it's about kind of like getting back into it to me in, in a certain way. I mean, way, way, way back, you know, 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you know, all, all those years, 2012, 13, all those seasons, I had a, a, quite a quite a large collection of Superdor stuff from all the beginning stuff that was made by like Corey Browning, that was kind of the first stuff to really be seen that, or that hit the internet to be seen ever, you know? So I actually picked babies from those original hats from the original snows and had that original snow and, and, you know, siblings of stuff and, you know, different localities that we had back then were just, everything was just super dwarf. And then, uh, you know, you could guess or people would write on there what island they came from. We were talking earlier about I had a snake that was a Honey Island Super Dwarf is what right. it was. I'll right. post it later tonight and somebody shit all over it. Tell me what you think about it. Whatever. <laughs> tell me what it is. Tell me what it isn't. doesn't matter because it was 20 years ago. So it's fucking irrelevant, really, I guess, to me, you know, at the moment. But anyway, I digress. I long time ago uh got into my head i was going to make a snow sunfire you know and i never did um that male i had did uh, unfortunately died i had a big issue with the rodent order that wiped out about half my collection of my like oh, best stuff shit. in like 2013 i had that some really sucks. cool cool stuff yeah a lot, a lot of stuff died but I recovered from that, and you know, I kind of realized Superdorf's stuff was not going to work for me. I uh, so I, I sold everything, and I focused solely on the Purple Sunfire OGS, you know, project by itself, not in snow. You know, so snow was to get into that. I just said, forget it, never mind. So 10, 15, 20 years go by, Superdorf's are still you know, screaming popular. Obviously it's, it's, it's at the forefront of our industry. Um, I still say it, I've said it a million times. If these snakes max out at the size of corn snakes, but were the exact same thing, there'd be no other reptiles in the hobby. Right. Aside, from, you know, some lizards, but everybody would own these, you know, if anyone's ever bred Australian species, the children's pythons and anthill pythons are the most they're just the most superior species to like a, to a suburban uh, reptile snake guy. I mean, they're the best things in the world because the size, their attitude and everything, but all the morphs are in Australia. So us Americans just want all the morphs, right. you know? So 
no one's going to buy into any of that stuff until there becomes all the morphs. You know, if white lip pythons had all the same extreme morphs, people would just be going nuts. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's what's available. There's a lot of other species out there. Um, you know, but e- either way, uh, to the super dwarf content, you know, I picked up that snow. Yeah. See, I told you I'll get off subject way <laughs> fast, way, way fast. So the snow, uh, was the first thing I, I saw it and I said, you know, all the stars aligned and it was the right time to, I'll just, just get, get back in, right? Get back into super dwarfs. It's the future of our hobby to a whole new wave of keepers, you know, no, nobody's knocking mainlands. I breed mainlands forever. That's what I do. I've done it forever, but I bought literally f- four super dwarfs. That's not a staggering number of like me jumping into some extreme super dwarf production. I have four animals. I have one, whatever you're going to, whatever is- he's going to be, but he's a pure male, whatever that, whatever he's going to be called. I have the snow and I have a 50% Kalatoa, 12.5% Jamp, Anery, Het, Snow. And then I have a 62.5% Motley GC, Het, Purple, Paz, Het, Snow from Eric. And that's it. That's that's my, this that's is my Shane's announcement. Superdorf collection. This is Shane's announcement that he's not selling out on mainlands. <laughs> I, I mean, I they, they make up a... See, the problem is this. My collection is like 90% of animals I've produced myself. Mm -hmm. So if I want to make anything brand new, I must buy them, get them, and invest into that new thing. Otherwise, it's like, you know, you're maxed out. You're capped out. If you are not progressing with the industry and progressing with the hobby and progressing with what people want, you know, if, if you got food on your menu and, and someone keeps asking for something else. Right. Retics are retics. I don't care what anyone's going to have to say. They're the best species of snake. And I, you know, I love every single one I can get. But who wouldn't want a little bit of a smaller snake being yeah. produced, you know, along the same lines as to what you do and take your time. You know, that's one thing I've always like. It's a long, long journey that you can't force. Um, so like all my double recessive projects, you really can't force your way to the – you have to work for a long time at really maybe making one animal. You know, like you can't keep like 50 of everything. You you know, you've, you work really hard to just get to one single snake. Mm-hmm. So the super dwarf journey, if you want to get upwards of 75% and all that, it takes a lot of time. And I like – to do things that take a lot of time because that's usually where I prevail. You know, I stick it out for a very, uh, very long time to get the goal I have in mind. You know, like I mentioned the pure male to that snow, I had posted some pictures, you know, maybe next year, maybe the next year, those will make double heads, but I want to see what the double heads from those specific two animals in the world are going to look like. I, I don't know where the labeling of Superdorf will be a year from now because ain't no one going to tell me it was going to be like this a year ago from today or even a month ago or six months ago or, you know, it, so I don't know where the industry is going to go, but I know those two animals are really awesome and I love them enough to breed them and just keep them. So if people want to invest into that, they're going to be investing into that philosophy too. So, you know, my mainland projects are still in full full capacity, you know, and I, I really only want to do one or two breedings of that male because I, I don't, I've got three or four more years to go for my female. So I only have, Oh, I lied. I've got two pure, a pair of peers. That's it. One hatchling female and, and the male that I talked about, but, um, you know, I, I want to see the long-term project go. So um, you would ask as far as selectivity, I'm, I have cut out a, a huge amount of genes out of my collection and a, a lot of animals to really streamline only on trying to just, in my mind, perfect for my own self or at least to my own taste is the uh, purple or orange glow or indo-caramel. 
orange ghost stripe that only has sunfire and jaguar you know if it's a super sun or vice versa whatnot but i want to make that in that category of animals in snow in a very very compact size to work just with that array of color and that array of genes you know i i don't have a choice but to make golden child and motley and tigers because that's what i've that's comes with a lot of the territory for all everyone's breeding projects to some to some extent right you know but i worked very hard to like get get rid of all my marbles get rid of all my phantoms um you know and 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 try to just wean down everything motley is is the next one i'm trying to wean out of the collection i'm down to just you know really two animals but they're also the two biggest oldest purple ogs motley and motley jags of that are out there so i'd be an asshole to get rid of those snakes just because i don't want to produce motley anymore i i, I want to see a few different morphs in it but the long long term is probably motley will go just because of the super form not being enough for me to look at to to enjoy making it so if i don't want to make it or keep it my own self i don't want to have it with my name on it for sale somewhere and be like oh I just made that just to make it because I'm an asshole. Maybe someone else really wants to make it because that's their that's their whole goal of breeding. And if they they hear a guy, maybe sure this will sound arrogant, a guy like me produce maybe motley babies and say I am not making super motleys. I don't, you know, that that's the truth for a lot of people. It's hard to hear that, but like. If people were like, I'm not taking this project this direction, that leaves a door for a lot of people who are trying to make a name for themselves in this hobby, leaves them a little room to to make some shit. You know, I mean, this is why everybody hated Jay Brewer. Every day, every clutch was like 6, 10, 8, 12, world's first, every clutch, every day, every time. Why would anybody want to buy into that project? Man people are in it for the world first stuff. You know, no one's going to want to buy into that if they're like, well, I guess there's no dream to try to make or hatch. You know, there's nothing even to desire, you know, there's, there's no desire to it. So, you know, um, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's what's a little bit wrong with the world's first mentality. You should, you know, appreciate these animals for what they are, find what projects you really love and just, you know, stay your course. Yeah. That's Dude, I had in your philosophy through ever throughout everything and and i'll tell you this i it's i am not the person that bought a hatchling and goes nah this project ain't for me i'm getting rid of it like i bought i had uh this has been like 2011 12 or 13 or some shit i had a blonde tiger and i had a sunfire hat blonde in 2011 or 12 or whatever raised them from hatchlings into full breeding adults she didn't take. I lost taste in the project, sold it. But I put my time into that project heavily to see if I, you know, was my heart in it when I didn't make it and I was so upset that I had to gun for it again? Said no. So I sold it. You know, same went with anthrax. I had like three or four attempts at getting my feet wet in anthrax. I had, I had a really dope purple sunfire anthrax that if I just would have stuck it out maybe a little more, I could have really gunned and made some cool stuff, but my heart wasn't there. You know, I mean, I, I really know. like, I like what you said earlier. And like, if I could take anything right now from this topic that we're talking about and like, hold on to it. I love what you said in regards to like, if you're going to produce stuff and it's not something you're willing to keep, then why do it? Right. Like, and that, that's like, that hones in so true. I feel like, like if, if, and I think that in yeah. and of itself can stop a lot of like overproduction, like produce animals that you're willing to keep. Well, yeah. You know, it, it, it's so hard because we touched on that in the very beginning of the last episode. Like there are people that are breeding to put units for sale on a table. Like right. that's, they're just, they hear, like I said, they hear 60 eggs. They think I could get five snakes and have 200 babies and have my whole inventory, you know, versus, you know, I don't know, man, there's so many ways to chop that up. 
Well, there really is. There's brings, a... brings us around to one of our final wrap up questions, which is there's a lot of talk in the current retic market right now about, you know, it being hard to sell animals and that there's overproduction of retics. But I think we're firm believers that someone with high quality mm -hmm. animals and perfecting their craft, you know, so to say, can still sell animals. So what's your current take on the retic market? And do you think it's in trouble? If so, uh, what are some you know, we can work towards? We are at a turning point in the retic world uh, where people are branding themselves truly. They're truly becoming a brand. And now those brands are taking off and they have a product with a person that people are buying from. I don't, I spend a lot of time in the uh, fitness communities and, and, a lot of these guys have, I know, cheesy to a lot of people, but they all have their own brand of pre-workout. And they all have their own t-shirt line. They're just, they're, they've branded their own personal self and they gain their own following off themselves. But if they make a piece of shit product, they fail. So we're, we're, we're in it. Well, he's coming back <laughs> strong, boy. He's looking good. Um, but so, you know, what's going on? Well, a lot of the pro and all right, that another subject. So what I'm saying is, though, we're in the current times. If you are staying with the current times of the reptile industry, you will still be doing well with your sales. If you're still producing animals that are highly sought after at a reasonable price, and you're not producing 40 of them or 60 of them, right? People still, excuse me, will want to buy those, you know, and people will still say, okay, I'll invest in this project. You know, I, it, it, you have to have the right product and the right person selling the right product and stand behind your own brand and your own self to really stay ahead right now. I mean, a lot of people are making names for themselves and it's, you know, I'm still working my ass off every day to try to stay relevant and current because I'm not the 16 year old kid coming in. That's like, oh, I got a real good job. My first job. I got some money to blow. Let's buy a big ass snake because they're cool. <laughs> hey, man, that was every single one of us saying the word retic. If you say retic every day, you just wanted them because they were a big fucking snake and they were cool. There's a new guy coming into a reptile show every year. But. If we can educate them with what's available now, you're an asshole if you pay for a personal trainer now, right? You just right. go on Instagram and there's unlimited videos working out fucking all across the board every day, all day, all the time. So if someone is not doing well in current reptile keeping, just husbandry, breeding, interactive, online presence, social media presence, being available 24-7 hours a day because that's what Literally. it takes if you're not if you're not staying current with with that demand you will fall behind so you know if some if you're not answering an email at 2 30 in the morning somebody else is and there's a lot of people trying to sell the same thing you're selling right now right at I the feel, same exact time i feel that on a different level <laughs> it's it's crazy man so you know you you got to be genuine and you gotta you gotta try to also, do your best to produce uh, something you truly do love and it shows you love because, you know, if someone loves it too, they want to buy it and they want to have it and raise it. You know, at the end of the day, these these are pets. You know, these are my pets. I don't have a lot of animals. I mean, I, I think people think I have like, you know, 200, 300 animals. You know, I've only got like 22 retics. That's awesome to hear. It's, yeah, it's not a lot, it's not that. a tremendous amount of animals and you know I have I have one retic available for sale and uh, you know I've got 14 ball pythons you know six water monitors it's not like I have like 400 of of these animals to stay on top of the program it just you have to pick the right animals and and you know it's uh you got to pick the right stuff for the right breedings, you know, and I've reached a point where I've kind of been able to like reach somewhat of an end game on, a, a, on parts of certain projects because, you know, I don't, 
I don't have to add anything to a purple GCOGS sun tiger. And she's a full grown adult almost, you know, she's over three years old. Like that project is right there. I could breed her to a purple OGS and be good and just be like, that's what I want. But you know, that's where selective breeding comes from. She's own, she's one of one and she will be one of one probably for several more years. And I would hope someone else can make them in the next year or two, but I might be the next person to make the second one, you know? So I can't, I can't say she's the best one I've ever seen. I can only say that for so long until there's another one or, or the, you know, the best one to me or the best one I've ever produced, you know? So well, that's where the long term obsession there's always going to be an improvement on what you're working on. There's, there's small, small details, you know, at the rate that I try to go at, you can only, you have to try to only move increments, you know, little granules every year of, you know, to try to build something along long term. Because if you do that, someone else, they can't, unless they're doing exactly the same thing, working just as hard, they cannot catch you. Like I've sold, you know, I've, I sell, I hold back stuff, but unless it's one of one, I, I will sell siblings to other world first animals or, you know, when I made double hats and stuff like that, I, I'm also too in the business to try to, it's a business, right? So I've sold some and, but then all the years later go by and I look around and I'm like, where's, who's Purdue? What, why is nobody else? hatching eggs out of these animals that I made five, six, seven, eight, nine years ago. And I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't have a good answer. I guess it's not a bad thing either, but you know, I, I try to stay ahead in my own project is, you know, so no one can beat me for my own self too. Right. You know, and I think that's somewhat my responsibility if I'm not mistaken, you know, if I'm trying to lead the way in a project, I better really be able to, also not just claim all the world first, but like, Hey, I've done a few breedings where I'm like, Hey, don't, uh, don't do this breeding ever again. It really sucks. You know, that it's not really a good outcome. So let's pump the brakes, you know? And I mean, I guess that's a good thing too, you know, to try to lead the way for good and bad. Yeah. You know, but at least I could try real hard and right. So I want to ask you, uh, I kind of just want to, um, end on a couple things here. And first and foremost, um, I want to any, so you've dropped just a bomb of a bunch of wisdom doing this for a while, talking about selective breeding, following your passion, um, and really just trying to perfect the little details of everything. But, um, anything else that you want to, uh, tell our listeners, does it have to be about that? It could be anything about Rita keeping or reptile keeping in general, just kind of a last message, something that, you know, Comes from the heart, I guess. Um, you know, if you're going to try to breed reptiles, it, it really must come from the heart. You must truly love what you do because you must care for these animals all day, every day. Like as if they were a dog in your house or, a, you know, a rabbit in your house, your kid's pet. You know, you, they're not just disposable animals. You really have to do this with your whole heart. And it is really hard. It is extremely hard. So... You know, before you scoop up 20 hatchlings in a year, give yourself some time to grow your collection really slow and, you know, pay attention to what you're doing because it gets overwhelming extremely quick. I've been doing this by myself for my, what, what is basically my whole life. And it's, uh, there's a lot of days that you get really, really, really backed up. You know, I've, uh, I've left the NICU with a newborn baby and had to come home and immediately start cleaning animals. I've been hit by a car and left on a stretcher and then had to be back in cleaning animals. You know, I've on my wedding days, birthdays, holidays, all the crazy stuff. It's around the clock work. So if you do this, you've got to commit with your heart because the money will not come if your heart's not in it. If you're trying to make a business out of it. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think I yeah. experienced that firsthand when I had my spinal infection and, you know, hooked up to IVs and that, that really tested how much do I want to keep these animals. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm super fortunate with all my, my health issues that I went with super dwarfs because they're a lot more manageable for me at that point to mm-hmm. be able to keep. But yeah, I mean, that'll, 
those kind of situations will really test yeah. your love for, for what you're doing. Yeah, man. Retics are, they're, they're ruthless animals, man. They're, they're, they are ruthless. Even <laughs> you get surprised every day, even by stuff you've, you think, you know, and you know, there's, they still got an edge. Oh, right. Yeah. So, right. I'm pushing off a knee surgery just cause I don't want to have to deal with that whole aspect of what the hell's going to happen. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I'll tell you a bad one. Eric and I, Eric Lee, we've ran a couple pretty significant races and you come home, uh, like over 50 mile races, crazy stuff. And you get home and you're actually, you're physically unable to, Oh, I bet to, to do anything. And, uh, fighting through that to clean, I think was worse than when I got hit by a car. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was really bad. It was a really bad time. I Running 50 that. miles sounds worse than getting hit yeah. by a car. <laughs> yeah, it might have. It was. It was. Yeah. Shane, where can our listeners follow you, catch up on you? Where where can they they tune in to see what you're doing next? Uh, mostly is on Instagram at SC Constrictors. Um, I know a lot of people have been asking for videos, but I will do a discredit to my own self trying to get my YouTube channel going right now with how much time it takes to put out proper content. So I'm leaving that to the content creators. I'd rather be some of, part of someone's content, but. Um, Facebook at SC Constrictors is good. I do have a private uh, group called Floating Epicness that is just more of an informational portal of some of the history of my project. So if you buy snakes from me or have bought snakes from me or they have sold or resold or changed hands and you need to reference it, um, as long as you fall into the category of you own or, or, or trying to own even secondhand, that information is for you to reference if you need it, if I am – you know, not able to find something. It is all there for myself to give to you too. So Facebook and Instagram at SC Constrictors. Thank awesome. you so much. Yeah, that that's an awesome cool. little uh, resource for your customers. But uh, Shane, yeah. I just want to thank you for all the time that you've put out for us. Thank you guys. Uh, coming back a second time, dealing with all the technical difficulties. You Fun know, times. Dealing with yeah. Phone all good, man. Like, I'm a yeah, yep. Honestly, um, with all of those hurdles, like this is one of my favorite interviews. I, I think, uh, like, just the way I look at the industry, it really aligns with the stuff you're doing. So I, that's good stuff thank to look you. up to, man. Yeah, anyway. well, thank you. Thank you, guys. You know, it's it's refreshing to see how the reptile world is evolving into something a little more, um, I hate to say the word domesticated, but normalized, where it, where it's become more of a, you know, there's a real good looking side to good looking reptile collections. You know, it, it's a luxury thing. It's really become more of a luxury thing. People are really treating these animals at a much higher class or a, a much higher level than the old days where just any old animal was in a fish tank with no light, barely any water, didn't give a shit, no big deal. You know, these it's really cool to get online and see just badass collections and really cool setups. And you could tell the people that really love these animals put in serious work i mean it's it's a lot of respect so it's cool yeah man um we'll definitely have to have you back on on another time i know you got some crazy genetic yeah. abnormality things that have happened with some pairings that i'd oh. love to get some uh some you know i'd like to pick some brains yeah. maybe do a live on that but shane have a good one man looking forward to this episode being cool. out and uh for you guys listening thanks for tuning in and dealing with Thank the you. technical difficulties so we will catch you okay. next Friday on the Retake Lounge. Take it easy.